when the scribes and Pharisees asked our Lord about the greatest commandment, he replied, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. So why do we hear some of today's most prominent pastors saying things like this? It had everything to do with how we talk about the Bible. And specifically, or along with that, what we point to as the foundation of faith, which for most Christians, unfortunately, is the Bible. We need to do better. We need to love God with all our hearts and stand unashamedly on the rock of His Word. We need to love the Lord with all of our souls and respond to the worldview issues of our day with the wisdom and discernment that comes only from Him. We need to love the Lord with our minds and understand the calling of God's people in every area of life in God's world. We need to love the Lord our God with all our strength and face the work of building a life-giving, God-honoring culture. Join us for 10 days at the Runner Academy for Cultural Leadership as we consider how the gospel influences all of life and culture and the role that we have to play in applying foundational Christian thinking to every area of life. This is The Academy. I am Eli Ayala of Revealed Apologetics, and I will be bringing a six-part series on presuppositional apologetics. What is this called, The Apology Academy? It's just called The Academy. Okay. What's up, everybody? My name is Pastor Jeff Durbin, and you're watching Collision Today. I'm going to be interacting with an atheist on TikTok. So here we go. Unsupervised and unhinged. Welcome back to Cultish the Aftermath. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Ask Me Anything. So you are watching Apologia Radio's after show exclusively for all access. I want to think it! <laughs> are you going to bark all day? Doggy, or are you gonna bite? We're right. delusional. The, yeah, I love you, Jeff. I delusional, guess. yeah. Delusional is okay in your worldview. I'm an animal. You don't chastise chickens for being delusional. You don't chastise pigs for being delusional. So you calling me delusional using your worldview is perfectly okay. It doesn't really hurt. <laughs> she hung up on me. Yes! Yes! Oh my God! What? What? Desperate times call for faithful men and not for careful men. The careful men come later and write the biographies of the faithful men, lauding them for their courage. Go into all the world and make disciples. Not go into the world and make buddies. Not to make brosives. Right. Don't go into the world and make homies. Right. Disciples. I got yeah. I got a bit of a jiggle neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, Pastor. No. When we have the real message of truth, we cannot let somebody say they're speaking truth when no. they're not. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, in verse 20, Colossians 1, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. How many things? All. All, all the things. things. Gotcha. Whether on earth, on earth, or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Amen. What's up? What's, What's up, up everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Apology Radio. This is Luke the Bear hosting today. Pastor Jeff is on his mandatory sabbatical, so leave him alone. Uh, that's all I got to say on that. That's what I've tried to do. Yeah, thank you. Mine's coming up, so I appreciate the... Oh, good. I yeah. get to leave you alone, yeah. too. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm excited for today's episode. So I'll just, I'm will just i going to get right into it. we got a lot to discuss. So yeah. um, first, I got my, my guy, uh, the DOC over here. 
I'm trying to think of a good nickname. I like, so Doc. far, I'm liking the DOC. <laughs> that's not, that's not it. Director of Communications. Good to be We're in abortion now. Zachary Conover. Yep, that's me. What up? What up, though? And for the first time ever on Apology Radio. And the last. <laughs> we'll see, yeah. Maybe the last. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. see. Yeah. Eric Yeager, There's you might another Yeager here. Other there than he, he, Summer, he, yeah, you might know him as Summer's husband. Yeah, that's good. And, that's a good thing. And or Doctor White's son-in-law. These are both true. Very so. true. Yep. I just think he's a brother in Christ, but that's me. Thank you. Me. I appreciate it. Some <laughs> grant me that title, yeah. just not the title of master. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of those are his real identity. I mean, they're part of his identity, they but that's not what he identifies in or as yeah as he identifies what is as my identity this is yeah, just thank going you. Like, i was wondering yeah, where we, we were going all with right. that one yes yes he identifies yes. in the lord i was getting to it okay it. thank you you're welcome thank you <laughs> all right there's a lot of things we've said true about eric today um they're all true so far so far um but yes he is a christian first husband second son-in-law even after that. Even after that, <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> after father. His right. Father yeah. In yeah. There's there a, fa- a father in there somewhere. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, hi. Welcome. Yeah, welcome, Eric, right? Yeah. It's, it's fun to be here. Oh, man. You can already tell it's going to be good. It's going to be I fun. I hope so. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So we've been getting a lot of requests from people to respond to Theocasts. Uh, they did a show a couple weeks ago. Uh, we're going to play some clips through that and kind of respond to some of it called a reformed response to theonomy so we'll we'll get to that they've got a, a series of shows we're going to hopefully get to in the future as well um kind of along the same topic so um so yeah hopefully uh you guys enjoy this um do we, i don't have anything else to really announce you got anything going on at the EAN? We no, should not really. I mean, other it's than... kind of quiet legislatively. Yeah, opinion. so we're passing kind of into a different season now and talking about yeah. how best to steward the momentum and the resources and the connections that God has brought about in our ministry so that we can ramp up for next year in that area. Of course, we're still yeah. doing all the usual stuff, connecting churches, equipping churches, but as to all of the activity of the first part of the year... Uh, you know, God's done some great things, some unprecedented things sure. in terms of how many states now are on board with this type of work and legislation. It's really powerful to be a part of it and to get to go to these places and to stand before the common kingdom civil realm there you are. and huh. command that they obey Jesus and okay. his law. Okay. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I, it's yeah. so funny. I was in the uh, state capital in Missouri. And it's, I mean, it's beautiful, which most state capitals are beautiful in on the interior part, especially, sure. but this one was just huge. And you go inside and you look on all the pillars all around on the interior and there's scripture everywhere. Hmm. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Wow. All of these verses inside, it's like, where did we ever get the idea yeah. that this yeah. realm or, you know, this entity isn't accountable to the Lord? Yeah. Where did, where did that come from? Man. <laughs> certainly yeah. didn't come from yeah. God's word I mean right. otherwise it wouldn't be quoted on the pillars that hold up the foundations exactly uh, <laughs> my joke threw me off um, is Alabama completely dead now for this as session? far as I'm aware yeah it, okay. it, it, it didn't uh, get a hearing yeah which building. is what we figured was going to happen yeah but that's how we get, we have to start in each state and then we can expose those legislators that fail to be courageous right, right. by their votes or lack thereof. Um, so yeah, like Zach was saying, our, for those that don't know, the legislative session in most states is uh, usually typically done by April. Alabama uh, was one that it went a little later, and so that's why we were Ohio. still out there. Ohio, yeah. Louisiana goes a little bit later. Pennsylvania, I think there's two states. Pennsylvania and one other go year-round, um, but we don't have anything going on in Pennsylvania this year. Um, so, yep. We kind of been hitting it hard this first quarter of the year. Now we're actually almost done with the second quarter of the mm-hmm. year, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, and then the rest of the year, we're going to be gearing back up to get to get going in those states again next year. So please be praying for uh, Zach and and those involved um, legislatively here and and across all these different states that people people were working with solid brothers and sisters so yeah churches more get, churches get more churches involved and the ones that are involved equipped and trained and mobilized for the activity sweet all right um okay so i wanted to bring eric on 
one specific reason. Um, I can think of a couple reasons. One's a lot of. There's a lot of reasons. But just one important one. But one, one. specific. Yeah. Um, his hat, for one. His hat is yeah, great. 1689, right? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that is very true. <laughs> yeah. Um, because uh, John and Justin from Theocast are 1689 Federalists. And there's one. Eric's my go to guy when it comes to <laughs> anything related to the, the uh, Baptist Covenant theology and 1689 Federalism, all that stuff. Like, Eric's my guy. So I was like, you know what? Why don't you, why don't you come on? Yeah. And your boss was like, He's sure, like, why take not? the yeah. time off. We'll even pay you. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's vacation time, you know, uh, but whatever. Well, it's PTO. Right. Hey, yeah, it's PTO, 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 baby. But, dude, you've been working your tail off, so you've earned it. I know. I was oh. telling Eric before this, anytime, like, we're messaging each other, I can hear him manually working in the background. Yeah. Like, I can hear the wrenches turning yeah. and the, the stuff gas. clicking. And yeah, working on different stuff, man, that. for sure. So he's talking to me about theology while it's, like, doing this kind of stuff. Yeah, on, only, like, you know, safely, though. Right. Always yes. safely. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we don't want to get him in trouble. No, we don't. <laughs> no, it's always very <laughs> always safely. very safely. <laughs> yeah. Safety first. <laughs> OSHA has nothing to be concerned about. No, with. no. He works for the gas lines, just, you know. So oh. Southwest Gas specifically, correct? Uh, it is true. That's okay. where I work. Yep. Yeah. I've never said that publicly, but oh. now there we go. That's all Sorry. Right. You're okay. <laughs> no, we're good. <laughs> They're going to see this and be like, oh, this guy. Uh, so if you want the address for the studio, just go just, to. Yeah. No, it's all right. That is where I work. Yeah, no, I do public utility work. Yeah. So. Yeah. You've been working a lot of overtime, right? Like it's not been bad lately, man. You 45, you 50 hours a week. You were doing a lot of overtime, weren't you? Yeah, it was crazy. Man. Yeah. All those kids get hungry. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah. Yes, they, they do. Again and again. Too. Yeah, all the it time. Stop. I know. Yes, they do. So. All right. So, um, first I wanted to, before I play some clips from this first episode, which, just for the record, we're not going to even touch a lot of it. Um, I tried to pull out some of the really meaty points that were really important to get to there's a lot there's just no way we can get to the whole to the whole thing um, but i wanted to thank these guys because i'm assuming they're going to watch this um they actually mentioned jeff and apology mm-hmm. studios by name yeah um and uh so if brothers if you watch this i wanted to first thank you for your charity and mm-hmm. graciousness you were it was very apparent that you wanted to to be gracious and to, yeah. and to raise some questions um, without being attacking, so thank you. Uh, we don't often receive that <laughs> sort of yeah, treatment in with that this spirit, position, that so. brotherly spirit. Yeah, yeah. So thank you, thank you very much. And and they were very clear they want to try to represent us uh, uh, correctly. I don't think they did a pretty decent job. Yeah, there was a couple things yeah. we'll bring up that I would disagree with, but I thought at least from the beginning you did a very good yeah. job of trying to represent us appropriately. So thank you for that. Um, so anything else you oh, want to add Let's before? Do it. I'm okay. ready. Let me uh, let me get rid of this here. Okay. Um, so maybe like yeah, bring, bring everyone into this video. I know they've done a few on this subject, theonomy. Yes. Yeah, so this one we're gonna play, like I said, is a reform response to theonomy. There, I think this is like the first one in the series. The next one they did was a pastoral, pastoral. response, and they've done one on cultural engagement. Yes, I they did that, that as well recently. So that just dropped this. Like this week or today or yesterday or something really new so we'll do our best to try to get to to everything so um so yeah like i said i'm going to skip through the the niceties and the graciousness um from these guys here at the beginning um so i'm going to get here gabe if you want to go ahead and pull that up um and i'll go ahead and play and we'll just i'll if you guys want me to stop just tell me stop Uh, hopefully my voice will hold up i lost it last week i'm I'm (laughs) We'll see. So theonomy essentially asserts that the judicial laws of the Mosaic Covenant are normative for all geopolitical entities. So civil governments are obligated, in other words, to enforce old covenant judicial laws, along with their penalties. And any law not included in the old covenant judicial code would be out of bounds, right? So in other words, theonomy understands that God has given the universal blueprint for civil government in the Mosaic judicial law. God has given us a template for how we do statecraft, and it's called the Judicial Code of Moses, right? And so I think it's important that before I even read Bonson, I just want to acknowledge this, that like the listener needs to understand that theonomy often comes packaged with Christian reconstructionism, you know, kind of the rebuilding of Christendom or the building of a Christian society, 
It often comes packaged with a particular kind of post-millennial eschatology that's very optimistic. Um, so in theory, it's possible to pull those things apart. Oftentimes, practically on the street, boots on the ground, it that doesn't occur. They often no. come together. And if right. you if you do, if you are familiar with Canon Press or if you're familiar with Apologia, you see a lot of these things coming together. Mm -hmm. That said, our aim today is to deal with theonomy historically and theologically. And let me read a little bit of Greg Bonson again, who I would understand to be... Okay, before we get into that. Yeah, maybe we could just... Okay, so right off the bat, um, I felt like that was a, a pretty fair mm -hmm. uh, definition of, of, of theonomy. Um, and so just to give a little background because we were, we were just talking about this before we started the show. Um, and we're going to get into the different the threefold uh, law in in the Old Testament, which they they agree with us. Well, I don't want to get too far in it because this point's going to come a little bit later, but we would acknowledge that there's a threefold law. There's the judicial, the moral, and the ceremonial. Um, and they're in agreement with us on that. Um, and so, again, that was a pretty fair uh, definition, I felt like. Um, and but the position we're, we're arguing from because they even mention it it may have been before this maybe after but they say basically there's christian reconstructionism and there's general equity theonom uh, theonomy and and they're trying to address both of them right. we're coming from a uh general equity position essentially what we're saying is that the, the um the judicial law given to moses in the old testament is god saying this is how you apply the moral law to society uh th through the judicial jurisdiction uh through crime or to punish crime and 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 how do you handle things in the civil realm um and so that's essentially all the all that we're saying is the enemy is that god has established this um objective standard right for how you handle these things in society again taking the when we say general equity we're taking the the general equity of the uh, the principles yeah. behind these laws, mm -hmm. behind the punishment that God's given. And so how do we take that general equity and apply it to society today? Mm -hmm. That's essentially what we're saying. And we're saying that, um, yes, all nations are accountable to God um, because he is our creator, right? Um, and Christ, and this is where <laughs> we're going to, we're going to try to, did not get too far into the eschatological conversation today, but it's going to be hard to avoid it. Um, well, but as they pointed out, and they pointed two out two things normally coincide sure, exactly, and they're exactly right. Yep. They're exactly right, and 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 I'll be honest. I was, I was watching this first this first um, uh, um, episode. I was kind of think trying to figure out like where they were coming from um, eschatologically, which again we'll get into later because um, it definitely has a major role in how you view. Um, addressing the culture and uh, addressing yeah. uh, the civil realm and stuff. But their, go ahead. Their perspective yeah. on the covenants and all of that really yeah. is the lens through which they uh, see and interpret the relationship of God's law to a uh, civil society and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, these questions. I think overall the definition was fair. I think, and they point this out as well from our side, you know, when we say theonomy, we define the words underneath yeah. that theos right. namas god's law god's standard but i think for the purposes of this discussion it's really essential to uh, say yes and amen to that but to go a little bit further and make sure that what's understood there is there's the choice between theos namas and something else sure and that choice is either going to be an adherence to uh god's word Mm -hmm. Or it's going to be an adherence or hearkening unto the word of man, right? Or self, yep. which is where autonomy comes exactly. from, auto self. And so, um, I think that needs to be laid down at the front for where the discussion ends up regarding the judicial magistrate, because the ultimate concern is that in this realm or in this sphere, if you will. Is this office that God has ordained allowed to simply go its own way in terms of what they are to enforce hmm. in relationship to the law, and in particular, the penal sanctions of the law? So the definition of theonomy, I saw there's a, a gentleman um, you know, online that has a really good working definition of theonomy, I think, and it's just God's judicial ethical rule of men 
at all times by his word. Hmm. That's, that's, I mean, that's, that's a succinct like that. summary yeah. of what theonomy is. God's judicial ethical rule of men at all times by his word. And yes, of course, that extends to all men everywhere at all times. Yes. That, that would be our position. Yeah, Absolutely. And I think like so much we can, we come from our different camps, our different sides mm-hmm. on this discussion, and, and we can get bogged down in language in particular ways that we want to express things. I, th- I think we're both aiming, both, both camps are wanting to aim at kind of the same place. Yeah. Is that not, none of us are saying, and I think they acknowledge this, none of us are saying that we simply take the Old Testament judicial law and smack it down mm-hmm. on 21st century America as if right. it's 100% job for like the same thing. Yeah. And nor are they saying that we're simply autonomous creatures that don't need to abide by God's law. Right. We're, we're recognizing there's the spot in the middle here. And I think both these pastors are, are, want to admit that, hey, the scripture is, is our standard here, that we yeah. need to apply the scripture, but it really does come down to an exegetical and a hermeneutical difference on how do we understand these Old Testament laws, what was the purpose for which they were given, yeah. and how do we apply that in a faithful way? I think they're wanting to. I think they're trying to. Yeah, uh, agreed. But, but ultimately, we are aiming to be faithful to the scriptures, and we're having some hermeneutical and exegetical differences on how we apply yeah. the Old Testament today. Yes, agreed. All right, let's uh, keep playing this right here. A seminal figure in the, the movement yeah. in the, the stream of thought. And for my money too, I think that he is the most intentional, deliberate, exegetical guy as I've read and, and examined. Agreed. These so I'm going to read a few quotes from Bonson's book called By This Standard, The Authority of God's Law Today. He says, quote, the New Testament does not teach any radical change in God's law regarding the standards of sociopolitical morality. God's law, as it touches upon the duty of civil magistrates, has not been altered in any systematic or fundamental way in the New Testament. So there he's arguing for what I was mentioning earlier. Right. He continues on. We must recognize the continuing obligation of civil magistrates to obey and enforce the relevant laws of the Old Testament, including the penal sanctions specified by the just judge of all the earth. As with the rest of God's law, we must presume continuity of binding authority regarding the sociopolitical commandments revealed as standing law in the Old Testament. Last one. It is advocated that we should presume the abiding authority of any Old Testament commandment until and unless the New Testament reveals otherwise. And this presumption holds just as much for laws pertaining to the state as for laws pertaining to the individual. You pause that real so, quick? Yeah, so, agreed. <laughs> I, like, well, this is another one of those areas that yeah. it's important we have these discussions, yeah. right? We, Many will say exactly as Bonson just said. I think what I've heard from other gentlemen on their side is saying, like, we don't simply assume this because they have this category, which is an important category to understand if you're going to even begin to understand this conversation, this category of positive law versus natural law. Yeah. Right? And and this natural law, generally speaking, would be synonymous with the moral law, the Ten Commandments, uh, at least as they're summarized, right? And that all mankind has this, all, all individuals are beholden to uphold this law, but then there's also laws that are posited on top of that, and where they would say that this moral law is expressed in this way at this time. Uh, for example, it's not innately immoral to eat the fruit of a tree. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. However, the moment God posits or po- makes a positive law that now you cannot eat from this tree, it becomes immoral for you to break that law. Right. So. They want, and, and it's important, but they want to make this distinction here between positive and natural law. And if we don't understand where they're coming from on that, I think we can often hear them going like, we don't mm-hmm. apply, God's law doesn't apply. And I don't think that's what they're saying. I think they're saying we need to understand that the moral law is binding on all people and all institutions. Mm-hmm. However, institutions have certain tools. The church has the keys. Right. Us as fathers, we have the rod of discipline and right. discipleship, and, and, and the state has the sword. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's, mm-hmm. I think, what would be kind of dividing that. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Do you want anything? I don't think so. Let's, okay. Yeah, let's keep going. There's a number of things going on there theologically that we're going to try to deal with in this podcast. Last comment from me in terms of chalking the field. I want to be fair here. 
yeah. reconstructionist theonomy and a different stream referred to often as general equity theonomy are not one and the same. No. And so reconstructionist theonomy involves the establishment of, of Christendom in a, in a Christian society, whereas general equity theonomy is going to argue for looking to the judicial law, finding the principles that it contains, and then seeking to apply that in geopolitical reality today, in geopolitical entities today. I would want to ask and the what brothers, we're gonna try like, do they agree with that last statement? Mm -hmm. Like, I know they don't agree with the first statement. So, brothers, do, do you agree with the second yeah. statement that we're to look at these Old Testament laws and, and see how they apply to geopolitical reality today? And if so, what way do we look at that? Yeah, it's a great question. What I do today is... is argue against both effectively by getting at the sort of kernel of of the argumentation. So, That's right. Okay. Well, there's your answer, in a sense. Yeah. We're going to argue against both of these perspectives. Yeah, and I'm just wondering how, though, because I, I don't, I guess, what I would love some clarification on, they might have gotten to it. This was a couple hours of videos between the two, but... I, I think, I think we might get into this a little bit more, but I think what they're arguing is that we should... Um, we should come up with civil laws by <laughs> strictly through the moral law in the light of nature. That seems to be the argument they're making. As informed by this yeah. particular view of this covenant, mm. which they introduce as the Noahic covenant. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. this is That's where it starts an to get kind of hairy. Yeah, this is an arrangement, and this informs you know what the role of the magistrate is in terms of providing for a harmonious society you know, uh, you know, healthy community relations, uh, the prohibition of, of evil, but, um, you know, all of these things are, are defined specifically. Mm -hmm. And I think that one thing we constantly have to bring back to the forefront of this discussion is, okay, those are the perspectives that were laid down. That's what you're going to be contending against. And so again, here's the way that this is posited. Um, theonomy or autonomy uh, by what standard exactly right. or who gets to decide what's just if we reject applying the basic moral principles of uh, God's instruction to the modern day situation mm -hmm. um, and how pray tell if we construct an ethical system uh, just penalties for infractions of those laws what is that based on that is going to be or uh, have an objective grounding, if not in God's law? Is, is it just going to be the product of someone's best guess? Is it going to be what works, pragmatically speaking, from a human perspective? Um, what criteria are we basing that on to show that this is going to be anything other than uh, man's fallen reason mm -hmm. or flawed perspective yeah. because that's that's kind of what what it comes down to yeah. is what will inform um, the way that law and the enforcement of that law is meted out in a society yeah. will it be God's word revelation or man's fallen reason like like in other words that just assuming for a second the the two kingdom paradigm just which, by the way, is what they hold. They hold. Which, yes. yes, which is what they hold. I think they call it the doctrine of two kingdoms. But uh, assuming that for a second, let's say that the civil magistrate is only to uphold the second table. Okay, if we're going to adopt that position, how? What is the penology from your position? Exactly. What What is the just penalty for that? Even just the second table. Do we look to the Old Testament at all? To inform what a just retro, uh, a just penalty yep. for breaking commandments five through ten are, or is this something that's floating in the air? Yeah. Like why the that's coyote it. falling off of yeah. a cliff? Right? Is this something that's floating in the air that we grasp at what works uh, yeah. according to our own understanding? And I, I would I don't understand how we could not look at what God has said as just a just just penalty uh -huh. for even the second table. Mm -hmm. And not be informed by that. So yeah. if they're informed by it, how? How are we informed by it? And and why reject some of it and accept yeah. other aspects? That's the question. Wait, wait, what's it anchored in? You know, what's it going to be grounded in? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I was going to say, like, what's important to know here is not all sins are crimes, right? And so, like, even just if we're going to say that we can only 
punish the second table of the law. Like, you know, like there's, there's plenty of things that God says, this is a crime that are also sins, but not all sins are crimes, if that makes any sense. And so like that, like you were saying, like we have to have an objective standard to, to be able to determine, is this sin a crime? If so, is it worthy of the death penalty? Is it worthy of repaying sevenfold? Like, you know, like where does this fall uh, according to God and his standard? And that's all that we're saying is like, if we're not using God's standard to deal with these sins that become crimes in society, then who determines again, Bonson, by what standard, what is the standard for determining whether these are righteous, moral, ethical punishments for these crimes if it's not god then who and why man? why lock a thief up in prison yeah mm-hmm. as opposed to making him pay back two or three times exactly what he's stolen exactly yeah exactly um okay so let's i'm gonna skip ahead here to this is the part where we get into the threefold twofold yes part that, of the this is su- super yeah, important let's here, go there so purpose which we're Absolutely. gonna get into we're in just a minute, minute. right yeah. so now we're gonna get a little bit nerdy hey look this is fun but, uh, Justin, do we want to now explain yes. the moral and positive? Okay. Yeah, so uh, another prong of our response, and these are all kind of building on each other, and I That's trust right. that will become plain, That's right. is the distinction between moral law and positive law. Or, let me be clear here, in this portion of the pod, when we say moral law, that should be understood to be synonymous with natural law. So That's we're right. talking about the distinction between natural law and positive law between moral law and positive law. And so right. what we mean by natural or still, moral law- Do not do not kill- d- Yeah, in this that, yeah. instance is this, again, it's summarized in the 10 commandments, That's but right. it is Summarizes this law things. written into creation, written on the human conscience that is That's known right. innately by all. That's the moral. It's the light of nature that yep. we can appeal to. Whereas positive laws are different. They are posited by decree or by kingly fiat. They are not dealing with things that are inherently moral or immoral, but once, the command, the decree is attached to them, they become so. Examples, eating the fruit of a tree is not inherently sin. That's right. But when God says, don't eat the fruit of that tree, it becomes sin. That's right. Circumcision, right? Not inherently moral or immoral to cut the foreskin off of, you know, your eight year old or eight day old boy that, but when God says you must do it, that decree makes it an issue of faithfulness. It makes it an issue of morality. That's and right. we can go on and give a number of other examples. I trust those so he, two will he, suffice. Right. So that's a, a positive law. Could, it's, it's a weird way of saying it if you're not. I remember the first time I heard it, I'm like, was there a negative law? <laughs> Correct. Maybe we can Correct. So, halt here for yep. just a second and say this, that, okay, once again, grant the premise for just a second here to examine it. But if man is not accountable to it until he um, hears it, right? Um, that that might prove too much. I mean, respectfully to these brothers, um, you know, people do not innately know the specific will of God as it relates to these things. But that's why we have scripture also. Like, that's that's the reason why we have the word of God to tell us. And so um, we have scripture precisely because we know that natural law is is insufficient mm-hmm. to govern these things. Yes. Right? It's sufficient enough to condemn us right. before God. Exactly. It's sufficient enough it's a great point. Um, to bring us underneath in relationship to God's law in condemnation, which is kind of the point, is that even if humanity has not heard these things, that doesn't mean that they are outside of a covenantal relationship with God, either obeying or disobeying. It seems as if what, either in Christ or in Adam. Yes, it right. seems as if what's being alluded to is that if fallen man has not heard this specific commandment, he's somehow exempt from being covenantally faithful or responsible to God. Whereas every single creature, every man, is in religious relationship to God, and he is working all the time, either towards faithfulness. Uh, to the image of God or unfaithfulness uh, to the covenant, right? He's he's responsible and accountable to receive both the commandment and the grace that God has ordained uh, for mankind to receive. And so, um, you know, Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now notice, it doesn't say Christians shall not live by bread alone. Hmm. man shall not live by bread alone. 
but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Every man at all times, in all realms, um, in all places, is responsible. And that's, that's why we send, of course, missionaries to go and preach the gospel because of man's ethical relationship to God. Uh, but I think just, just highlighting that one point is that no one's exempt from responsibility based on what they haven't heard. Yeah. Now, if you want to you know, classify that as just purely the moral law, um, all right. But, I mean, I just wanted to highlight that point there. I do think – go ahead, Pastor. I was just going to say that there's plenty of examples. We I mean, don't have time to get in all this today, but there's plenty of examples in the New Testament even – where the writers of the new testament or christ himself pulls in these old testament judicial laws that we're speaking of and assumes them as true like not muzzling the ox for example um while he treads now um that is not a i would not consider a light of nature command right it's not like it's a pretty obscure exactly right and there's law. plenty of like that and even like our laws in our society today were written based upon the English common law, which was written based upon the laws of Moses, right? So, like, a lot of the laws we have on our land today, these these guys would, would be all for and uphold, but what's the standard for those? It's God's word. It's God's law to begin with. So, like, to say that we should only use the moral law and, and what's revealed to us in light of nature, it, like, leaves a lot... <laughs> A lot of things that aren't covered under that again even if you tease that out to its conclusion yeah. applying you know don't muzzle the ox while yeah. it treads and of course that's applied to ministers getting their just compensation for their duties right are we really going to suggest that just because that's applied to a new testament church official uh that it that's that doesn't have any bearing for the employee expecting a just exactly. wage for his efforts or, or an ox <laughs> like does right. the, just because it's exactly. applied to a minister does this mean that we don't we don't have to feed our oxen any yeah. longer yeah uh, that that is still applicable and yeah. I, I think one of the i don't know if i heard it from it's such a, it's such a true point that's brothers, why i laughed from these brothers or it might have been from van drunen's book um but i don't think they're denying that every individual every individual is accountable to uphold god's law and that and that the light of nature is enough to condemn them and that that's the purpose of of the gospel. And I, I think where I hear most of them come from is not denying that, but rather saying that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords in all of these areas, but the way that he exercises his kingship is going to be different. And that ultimately when the civil realm bears the sword, they only bear the sword against the love your neighbor portions yeah. right. that they don't have an yeah. obligation and they're actually that, that I think they would argue that you'd actually be unfaithful to King Jesus if you were to ask the civil magistrate to uphold anything within the first table of mm -hmm. the law. And that would be where my big difference yeah. with them is. Uh, yeah. This isn't an imposition. I'm not, a, I'm not advocating for imposing a certain religion upon society. I don't think most theonomists are. However, we would all recognize that there's a vast difference between Satanism and Christianity. There's mm -hmm. a vast difference between Satanism and Islam even uh, when they're carried out uh, carried out to their logical conclusion. And, and so we can't say that just because the civil magistrate isn't promoting Reformed Baptist yeah. theology and society that they somehow get to act as if they're neutral. Yeah. There's one God, the triune God. Yeah. And we need whose to, servant they are. Whose servant they are. Exactly yeah. right. Um, and when something becomes apparent, if somebody is obviously publicly sinning against the one true God, that's where things, the civil magistrate would have to step in. This isn't sneaking into people's bedrooms or into their mosque, what they're doing in private on prop, private property, because God honors private property as well. Mm -hmm. But when there's, when there's public unrepentant sins against the one true God, that's where the civil magistrate mm -hmm. should step in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So things like Pride Month. Pride Month <laughs> isn't a perfect example. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking we're in June Yeah. right now. I mean, and if you don't want to say that what those people are doing is false worship, then I don't know what to tell you. The reason that we know it's false worship is because men are getting arrested for preaching on the sidewalk to yeah. them the scriptures mm -hmm. and committing the equivalent of our public modern blasphemy laws right. speaking against the false gods that we've come yeah. to recognize as 
apparently having the authority in our land to such an extent that, you know, an entire people group have protected class status to worship them. Yeah. So Great not point. whether, but which. Exactly right. So I'm going to, I'm assuming we're going to have a lot of people listening to this that are new to this discussion. So I'm, I'm going to give you one more example of, of a law that we, uh, the anonymous like to use. That's a good practical law. And it's the, the pair put pair put around the roof, right? So like God's law, um, commanded that you put a parapet around your roof they would go up on the roof at night it was cool up there that's where they'd hang out and if you didn't and someone fell off and died you would be responsible for that life right and so like that's that's a really easy one to take that general equity and apply it to our our culture today and like you know we live in arizona they do that too in the episode don't they did they bring they may have yeah they use that specific example so you know we live in arizona a lot of people have pools when i bought my house we have a pool the very first thing i did was put a fence around my pool because i didn't want any of my kids or anybody else's kids or anyone wandering in falling in the pool and drowning it's the same we take that principle we apply it and but the point is like that's just wisdom and it's really based upon love of neighbor right you don't want your neighbor to die you love them enough to spend some money to make it safe so they don't drown and you're on your property um, but again that's not something we get from the moral law or necessarily you know you could, this is that we apply that's it. again it's applying the moral law to society it's not something that's found in the light of nature mm-hmm. it's something specific from god that's just straight wisdom and it's love of neighbor but we can't just be dependent strictly upon the moral law and the light of nature in society when it comes to applying those those principles. And it's worth mentioning real quick that the police aren't going around checking backyards exactly. for mm-hmm. for fences around pools. Right. Uh, th- this isn't just because we apply this doesn't mean that the civil magistrate now goes around and polices yeah. the intricacies of everybody's life and what they do on private property. But when an actual sin crime occurs, that's when the civil magistrate. Yeah gets involved not before yeah well and and with the pool one if you don't have a fence and a kid drowns you're liable yep so in other words there needs to be a victim yeah (laughs) for the police for it to be a crime (laughs) yeah yeah bingo okay let's keep going what what it means i I think is a good definition uh by divine fiat it's it's being decreed you could even say decreed decreed law that's right yeah yeah. And that's important to understand that, that the, those two, because, all right, I'll just kind of jump into some of the theonomy argumentation, Justin, is that one of the biggest one is that there is a there is a struggle to believe that the moral law is sufficient to accomplish what it has presented to do, which is to govern the heart of men and the minds of men. And uh, this is why even the Bonson's book says by this standard, you know, the question is often asked in his book, by <laughs> what standard right. do we tell someone they are right or not right before God if we're not using the law is sure. what typically has and, been given. Yeah, and we would absolutely say that regarding the moral law. That's right. Again, known innately, people know to kill someone is wrong. Right. People know to steal something is wrong, right? That's what's unique about the moral law or in the natural law, right? The light of nature, we can appeal to it. Whereas when it comes to the positive laws, nobody would know innately, nobody would know that they should obey it unless they're told to. That's right. Again, remember, nobody would know that I don't eat the fruit of that tree unless I'm told that. Nobody would know that I need to circumcise my son unless I'm told that. Nobody would know that I'm supposed to let my, you know, pick, I'm kind of collapsing some categories here, but in terms of positive laws, nobody would know that I'm supposed to rest my fields on the seventh year, or nobody would know that this is how we're to handle an issue of a of kinsman redeemer. Like if if I if my brother is married, you know, under the old covenant, right? If my brother's married to his wife and they don't have children and he dies, then I, as his brother, am to marry her and have children for my brother's sake. Nobody would know that. That's right. You know, unless you're told to do it. Right. And I don't want to jump the gun here. We're going to get into this in a minute, but we would understand that the ceremonial law and the civil law of Israel are positive law. Right. Whereas the moral law is moral and it is natural law in that regard. You can appeal to it as such. It comes back to what you were talking about. Like this is that, that leaves us. How how do we apply it then? Yeah. If we, if the civil law and, and the ceremonial law, 
have been abrogated except insofar as their general equity applies, right? We do, how do we apply the innate moral law in such a way that honors God? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, without a, a just penalty, because yeah. that's part of it. It's precept and sanction. Like we can't be faithful to God in the way that we construct laws without those two things. Otherwise, what we're positing is just good advice. You know, mm-hmm. like you should do this. You ought not do that. Well, what happens if I don't right. follow that? Right. Um, you know, there's got to be a way. Mm-hmm. There's got to be a mechanism for enforcement. But I think that might be the next place to to spend just a minute here is, you know, the longer we have this discussion, the more uh, necessity there is to be precise even with these things, the ceremonial and the civil law, because he just gave several examples of things that would be considered both ceremonial and civil. And so we have to be judicious in the way that we examine each one of them, because we would readily agree. I mean, here's the thing. And they say this, Israel had a unique status as the people of God. Um, You know, it was given laws concerning sacrifice and the tabernacle and the priesthood and you know uh, holiness code and you know ceremonial cleanliness laws and and all of those things that ultimately point forward to jesus and and are satisfied uh in him and that law is still very much in effect today how do we know that because there's a man reigning in heaven who has transposed all of those shadows and symbols uh in himself and now he ministers in Uh, before the heavenly tabernacle Mm -hmm. to which we have access to. So says the book of Hebrews. But here's the thing. We can distinguish that, uh, you know, the ceremonial aspects with simple justice. Like just because these laws, if you want to classify them as ceremonial, which is fine, they did have a unique status for Israel. They were relevant only for Israel um, so that the line of the Messiah could be Mm -hmm. preserved, that people could learn holiness and what these things meant until the substance of the shadows had come. We can't then say that justice is only relevant for the nation of Israel. Hmm. These ceremonial laws were only relevant for them in the sense that it pointed forward to Christ. Of course, they're still relevant because they're completed. Christ completed them. Right. But it's it's a stretch to then say, and it doesn't logically follow to me, that therefore God's prescription of what justice is and what it looks like is only relevant for the nation of Israel. Mm-hmm. Excellent point. And that's, and I'm trying not to get too far off here, but that's one thing we discussed that I would like to have seen more conversation about is they kind of just make this assertion that these things uh, the 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 judicial laws no no longer apply to anyone. They only apply to Israel. They make that assertion, but they don't really ever uh, dive in and explain why, or it definitely don't show from Scripture why. Yeah, they um, they give their three main points, right, which are the the threefold division of the law, yeah. the moral positive element, and then the covenantal structure. Yeah, there, which we're probably not even going to get I mean, touch today. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so like again, for those that are new to this conversation. We're, we're about to get into the like threefold part of the law. So again, it's the judicial, uh, moral, and ceremonial. We would say it's hard for me to say. Cere- I when know. I say it too many times, I know. it's, it's like I end up a ceremonial. Yeah. <laughs> so the the moral law, obviously, we've talked about is is the Ten Commandments, right? Um, and then the ceremonial law, we would say, um, were the the laws that God placed on Israel to set them apart. It was a picture of Christ, and when Christ came, He says in Matthew, "I came not to." abolish the law but to fulfill it he didn't get rid of the law he's saying he fulfilled that uh portion of the law and then again the judicial then is how do we apply those moral laws essentially to society this is really important too because so many christians even have this notion um you know there can't be it's almost like they nix civil justice in the name of jesus satisfying the law like jesus came to satisfy the law uh, therefore, the civil order, let's just leave it to itself. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Jesus satisfied the law, uh, yes, but that doesn't mean that we don't have such a thing as temporal justice right. yeah. and people being punished for crimes. Otherwise, if the wrath of God was satisfied in this temporal way, we wouldn't have Romans 13 telling us that the magistrate is the one who uh, 
bears the sword and is the wrath-bearing avenger mm-hmm. of God. That kind of goes into, and stop me if you want to no, get back on it. track, or that kind of, speaking of Romans 13, that does kind of get back into that third point that they have. Yeah. Um, they'll want to use Romans 13, they'll want to use Genesis 8 and 9, and mm-hmm. speak about the Noahic Covenant, and then and also look at Romans 13 and other sections of Scripture to say, here's what the Scriptures tell us, mm. the role of the civil magistrate is yeah um and i've heard those arguments and you should look into them and read them but when you look at romans 13 in particular talking about the civil magistrate as a deacon of god a servant of yahweh and what they're commanded to uphold there just because what we see in romans 13 the examples that are given are from the second table that is true but that does not necessitate that they are not also ministers to the entire moral law. We, we, you would need to establish that they are not ministers for the good of people according to the entire law. And I think they root that in the Noahic Covenant, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And do a 30-second just quick hit yeah. so at least some people that aren't familiar yeah, yeah, give it to us. with why they would hold this view, I believe, is that when you look at the parties of different covenants, right? I, I have a wife. You guys each have wives. So that's a particular covenant. Mine is with me and my wife. You are you and your wife. When you look at the Noahic covenant, the parties that are specifically mentioned there, it includes all of humanity. And so they would say the Noahic covenant applies to all of humanity. But then when you, and that's where they would establish the common kingdom. Yeah. When, when you start getting down into As Abraham. As opposed to the sacred kingdom as opposed or the to redemptive the redemptive kingdom. kingdom where you'd get down to abraham and moses and david and ultimately finding its fulfillment in the new covenant those apply to a specific smaller subset of the larger one so they'd say there's this large common kingdom governed by a covenant that had noah as its head and all of his offspring essentially right but it's not just that and and here's where i kind of take issue with that is is that true is everybody under the noahic covenant yes that is true. But it, what, the covenant wasn't made strictly with Noah. Mm-hmm. If you look at the text, and if we're going to allow the text to yeah. actually determine what, who the members are, right. it's not just Noah. Yeah. It's actually the animals, every animal that was on the ark. And you could even make an argument from the text there in Genesis 9 that it's actually with the earth itself. itself. Yeah. So, so we don't do anybody any favors by simply looking and saying this applies to all people without recognizing that the Noahic covenant was implemented after Noah sacrificed an animal on an altar in Genesis 8. A religious function. A a religious function, uh, which I would argue points right back to the covering of Adam and Eve in the garden. Yep. And and God promising a redeemer who would conquer sin, Satan, and death by the seed of the woman. Yeah. Noah's covenant that was God made with Noah to, to sustain the earth was specifically given so that the Messiah could come and take over the nations. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and, and we can't lose track of the fact that just because it includes all people, that doesn't mean it only includes people. It includes mm. everything yep. that is going to come under the feet of Jesus. Like all yep. things. Like all things and in I, heaven and on earth. It's, it's so, the, it, examining that's so important because there is a, a recapitulation of the dominion mandate in Genesis 1 Bingo. there as well. The and thing. so God is giving these things to us it's so interesting you said that even the earth Mm -hmm. is connected to this covenant you know it says in isaiah elsewhere the earth lies defiled under its inhabitants the nations have violated the everlasting covenant so that also includes uh, the creation itself Mm -hmm. which makes perfect sense with what paul says in romans Mm -hmm. 8 how the creation itself is groaning with eager longing and expectation for the children of god to be revealed it's longing uh, to be revived along with the rest of us. Why? Because it's laboring under the curse of Adam's sin. The earth itself is. Yeah. And so for all things yeah. to be redeemed, that would include not only sinners and their pretty little souls right. once they get cleaned up, but that includes all things. All things. <laughs> the earth as well. This fall, Everything touched by the curse of Adam. Not, not, not every individual, mind you, but all things. He's yes. bringing all realms. Yeah. Restoration all, everything all is things. coming under his feet, and some of it will be through grace, and mercy, and some of it will be through judgment. Exactly. But it's all being placed under the feet of Christ. Yeah, I uh, I learned this from our friend Andrew Sandlin. Uh, he, he talks about how Christ came to vanquish the works of Satan, right? Mm. And he says, 
and and those extend as far as the curse is found, yep. which is everywhere. everywhere. Just like Joy to the World. <laughs> exactly. Right? That's, that's why we sing about exactly it. Exactly right. You know? Exactly no more right. That sins and sorrow grow exactly. and thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow. So we sing that every year at Christmas, but do we understand it, one, and yeah. do we mean it? Well, that's the verse we typically leave out when we sing exactly. it, right? Exactly. You, yeah. can't leave the, you can't sleep on that third verse, bro. That's... <laughs> There's so much there. Exactly. <laughs> so here, let's let's finish here on this this last point here because we're running out of time, and then we are going to continue in the after show. We'll try to get to as much as we can at that at that point as well. Which has a the, ton of implication for what is binding on people today that's in a right. different era of redemptive history. So for those of you that maybe have lost, you know, we've, we've been going through. So let me bring this back so you understand. Part of the debate here is it um, should nations. Right. be required to live under positive law exactly. and then be punished by their corresponding judgment that God puts yeah. upon it. That's the debate that theonomy is about. So we wanted yeah. to take this time to appropriately represent them. I, th okay, I think exactly. we can definitively show from history yeah. as well as scripture exactly right. that God did indeed covenantally hold nations accountable that were not Israel. Yep. Actually, I've been, I've been itching to get at it. That's, you want to get it? I, I know, and I go. see yeah, it. That's go. why I'm like, let's tee it Because, well, this is important before you do, because they, they actually, it may be here, but there, at some point they actually mention, the theonomist will say this, but they're, and forgive me if it's not the spot, their their explanation I found lacking, but go ahead. So we all understand in Leviticus 19, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Right after that in Leviticus 20, there's a, a, a break here where it says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, this starts a new section and we, what we see there is the judgment of the Canaanite nations. Right. Right. What were they judged for? It was not strictly, read the text, it's not strictly for violations of the second table yes. of the law. They, those are there. Right. Those are absolutely there. But there's also violations, when you get into Leviticus chapter 20, of idolatry. Uh, there's violations of murder, sacrificing and offering your children to Molech, second table. But the first table, there's idolatry. There's profaning the name of Yahweh. Yeah. That's the first table. And, and, and Yahweh says that he drove these nations out yeah. for that. Yep. And that he was going to then hold Israel yep. accountable to the same thing. Therefore, be holy, set yourself apart to me like these Canaanite nations did not. Mm -hmm. So even these these pagan nations, these Canaanite nations, the seven nations that were driven out by the people of God, they were held accountable yeah. and they were judged by God. They were judged and kicked out for violating the first table of the moral law. We cannot say that nations, and it says nations, yeah. we cannot say that nations are not obligated to uphold the first table of the law when we have explicit examples of God judging nations for violating not only the second table, but the first table as well. Amen. Which is why the prophets were sent to the foreign nations, because they were God's prosecuting attorneys. Mm. But what were the terms by which they were prosecuting the nations? Violation of God's covenant. Mm -hmm. They were covenant breakers. Mm -hmm. And just like God judged his own people, he judged them for the same exact things, even up to and including the penalty for the violation. What is there a different penalty for his people than there was for the nations for violating these things? No, it's the same thing. The land's going to vomit you out. It's going to expel you. I'm going to expel you and all your inhabitants from the land. So it's not just that God doesn't have two sets of ethical standards, right? Or two moral codes. Um, you know, it, it's also that he doesn't have two different sanctions mm. or penalties. Mm. Um, in that way, of course, there you know we can look at as we try to apply the, the general equity of these things to the present day. Yeah. There are you know there might be ways in which crimes are punished that God gives allowance for as as to more than one uh, sanction. Yeah. Right, that's not what I'm saying. But in terms of the moral codes that God gives, we can't just split them up, right? Right, artificially, and that seems to be the kind of thinking even in the system is that. There's a there's a division. There's an artificial division. You know the 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 redemptive kingdom and the common kingdom. God's law over here and God's law over here. Hmm. And there there's these differences where, you know, if if that's what we're gonna posit, it could just kind of drives a wedge between creation and recreation, hmm. right? A, a holistic biblical worldview, and the schizophrenic nature 
of what we're attributing to God if we're going to hold on to yeah. that. That's there there is an appropriate distinction. Christ himself gives an appropriate distinction. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor on yourself, right? As yourself, he makes this distinction saying that there's these two aspects. However, I don't see him anywhere saying that any individual or any institution yeah. does not, according to the tools, and this is important, according to the tools that God has given them upholding the entire moral law of mm -hmm. God. Does that mean that this that the civil magistrate gets to come and discipline my children for stealing cookies? No, no, it does not. Nor does it mean that I get to go arrest my neighbor when he committed a crime. Right. However, we are both looking to the very same moral law and applying that mm -hmm. and exercising that according to the tools that God himself mm -hmm. has given us. But it's the same moral law that applies to everybody Amen. in Toto. Amen. All right, I'll try to get through this real quick. And this also important. set up the situation and say that, okay, there's some collapsing and confusion of yeah. categories here. And a really important, really important, like flashing red light important thing to say at this point, and it makes sense now to say it. Theonomists, in terms of the traditional argumentation, like Greg Bonson, for example, they see not a threefold division of the law, but a twofold division of the law. That's right. Rather That's just simply false. I don't know. He's going to read a quote from Bonson. Which yeah, you, I would just need to see wh where yeah, where I, that reference is. I, being it's just not true. From. I that's why I spent so much time trying to set this point up. It's just simply not true. I don't know any theonomist. I've never read a theonomist that would say there's only a twofold law. I'm going to keep playing here before, and then we'll address it. Other than seeing moral, ceremonial, and civil, they see only moral and ceremonial. That's and right. what they do. And what Bonson says is that the judicial law of Moses is moral law That's just right. illustratively applied. So in that That's, sense, okay. the yeah. theonomic but, argument is that the judicial law is moral law. And we would... Respectfully, brother, like, you've posited that. None of us have said that. I don't know anybody else that says that. Um so that's just not that's just not that's where I was like, they've done a really good job of representing us until this point. I was like, nobody says that, nobody believes that. No it, it's that sort of thinking seems foreign to us. And in in his explanation of the judicial law, yes, that's true, but it's still it's it's a law and set it's it's part of the threefold law. It's not simply the moral law. So there's my my timer. The so last thing that I would say is the article is important, right? Uh, speaking to you directly right now, pastors, uh, I think you would want to make a distinction between a covenant of grace and the covenant of grace. And a lot of times when people speak about moral law, there's a distinction that needs to be made between a law that is moral because everything that God commands is moral. He cannot command yeah. something that's not moral. There's a distinction to be made between a law that is moral and the moral law. The article matters when we're having this discussion, and, and this matters for everybody. I would like, I, I guess it, it does seem like there's a little bit of confusion there, and that's not something that anyone I know personally is would actually advocate for the what you're saying. Yeah, that's a helpful helpful way to put it. I think. Yes. Okay. So um, we're gonna we're gonna end there. I'm just sorry. They just uh, Gabe just pulled up the super chat, so I'm gonna try to answer these in a second. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna end on this point. Like I said, we're gonna uh, continue this conversation into the after show, and I have another like <laughs> two, three, four, like six points pulled up that we're not gonna get to. So I apologize, but we're doing the best we can. This is a really great conversation. Um, so all that to say, Andy P left this two super chat questions thank you uh, he said it would be helpful if a list was written up of what law should be created and their enforcement then we can hold the legislators feet to the fire uh, i'm not really sure you, you have any thoughts oh. i feel like that has been like <laughs> yeah that's what we've been talking it's, about yeah, today yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah just talking about laws from yep. the torah essentially yeah. right um i got you that's that's what it seems to me, anyways. Uh, that w so I think maybe just looking for something, um, a reference point to yeah, say yeah, yeah. to magistrates, here's what God requires of you, and um, you know. So yeah, so I'm trying. I mean, there's plenty. There's been plenty written on it, um, theonomy and Christian ethics, but that's a fat yeah, old book. I, I don't think there's an there's exhaustive not, list yeah, there's not, anywhere. Yeah, I think it's just as we study Scripture and as we come across these things in God's providence, that's what we. You know put forward is like okay we're, we're certain now this is what god requires yeah. so 
if if exegetically we can make that case um, and and suggest wisdom on how to apply it um, and encourage our civil magistrates to do so, then I mean absolutely. I, I think like so. <laughs> Just speaking of providence, right? Uh, a good list that we can have is going to be determined by the battle that's in front of us. If there's a certain exactly. battle that's being fought, yeah, then that's the scripture that we bring to bear. Does that mean that the rest of the scripture is not applicable or valid? No, but it means listen. Here's the battle that's before us. There's a lot of other battles behind us. We'll address those when we yeah. get to it. But here's the one in front of us. Yeah, legislators. Here's what God says on this topic. Hopefully we Submit demonstrated that with the issue of abortion. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. that's the fight in front of us, culturally speaking, right. at this very moment. Yeah. One and, of them. Yeah, and exactly. And so to just t- tie in what you were saying there, like I was thinking as you were answering that, um, again, I mentioned this earlier, but a lot, I would say the majority of our laws, original laws, the Constitution, the amendments, all that were based upon the English common law, which is based upon the Mosaic law. like, right. And so... Um, they were good laws to begin with, and you're you're exactly right. Like, you know, basically, as these things come up, we should be we should be examining every law that's brought to our attention, whether it's something we vote on or whether it's something that legislators vote on or are voting on or should be voting on. Like, we should take every single one of those laws and look at it through the lens of scripture and say, does this law uh, honor God? Is this a just law according to God's standards? And that should really be how we should yeah. be approaching it. Um, and there was something else I was thinking I completely lost it, but yeah. So There's work to be done, a lot of work to be done in oh, that area, but maybe as a, a reference point too, I know Bonson and the Anime and Christian Ethics at the very end in the appendices has the copy of the New England uh, law code basically oh, yeah, yeah. for the colonies. Yeah, yeah. And just seeing mm. how they treated those things in degree of you know dependence and priority and all that as, yeah. it, as it relates to scripture, I know it's helpful to see an example historically. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for that. Um, so I remember what I was going to say, and we I was hoping to get this. It's at the very tail end of this uh, where they mentioned Romans 13. Eric touched on it briefly. But really, Romans 13 d- defines for us the role of the civil government. It's to protect the innocent and punish the evildoer. So if the leg- if the civil realm is trying to do anything outside of that, they're outside of their jurisdiction. Um, and that's just defined by that <laughs> passage right there. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. I know we kind of rambled on there. but uh, So the other question, and to be honest, I do not know the answer to this. He says, wasn't Wither- Witherspoon a theonomist? Should he and the other founding fathers have pushed harder to have more in the Constitution like add chapter 23 of the Westminster Confession or you something. You know, we fixed the Westminster. I don't know if we did. you're aware of that, Andy. Um, we did. But <laughs> this is where I need Zach Lautenschlager. Uh, well, Zach Lautenschlager would, would nail this question. He would. I Forgive me. I, I don't know the answer to that, yeah. brother. Um, that's out of my realm of knowledge. So, um, anyways, thank you. Thank you, brother. So, okay. We'll go ahead and uh, in there. So, I'm going to pull us out and then... Like I said, we'll continue this conversation into the after show. So as always, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone, for supporting us. Uh, you can sign up um, through apologiestudios.com to get all access. That helps us keep the lights on. That helps the gospel go forth. We've been adding a ton of new content to all access, and there's plans to continue to do that Do that throughout uh, as long as we can. Um, and... Um, also get your free Monson you speaking of Greg Monson you can get your free Monson you account there as well and uh, thank you for your support for End Abortion Now Action for Life everything we're doing to try to end uh, the slaughter of our pre-born neighbors in this nation um, so Zach thanks dude <laughs> you got it Eric this was fun bro we'll have to do fun, this man. again man. Yeah, good time absolutely yeah time. sorry we didn't even get into the whole reason I brought you on here but we might get we might get we to might. the after yeah. show hey, yeah happens. he's gonna be in the after show yeah if you want to know what that reason is yeah. you better tune in exactly right. marketing <laughs> all right well we'll uh, <laughs> like I said we'll be back next week my plan is to get into the second video next week the pastor's response to theonomy and I have a guest special guest uh schedule for that but i'm not going to mention it because just in case he can't come on for some reason so hopefully he'll be we get to go and i'm excited for that so um we'll see you next week peace out everyone later